there's so much that we know and so much that we don't know. Even with RA, we know that there is a genetic component, but that's not everything. Welcome to Arthritis Now. Today we're talking to Dr. Susan Carpenter, who is a researcher and assistant professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Today we're learning from Dr. Carpenter about her early research into long non-coding RNA and how it may lead to future diagnostic testing as well as treatments for various inflammatory diseases. What did the ANRF grant do for you and allow you to do with your research? Yeah, well, um, I think the ANRF for me came at a very important time in my career. Uh, I got it first when I was a senior postdoc and trying to transition to independence. And so really for me, getting this grant, I believe, really helped me in launching my independent research program. And it also really allowed me to kind of develop my niche area which is studying long non-coding RNA in inflammation. So you were really able to take your unique idea and run with it, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's wonderful. So how did you first get interested in researching arthritis? From the start of my um, research, I have always worked in inflammation. I don't necessarily have a personal reason for um, going after uh, rheumatoid arthritis, I actually am asthmatic, <laughs> so I definitely know the inflammatory realm of, of uh, illness, but because I've always focused on this early inflammatory response, and we call it the inducible inflammatory response, I've kind of always been intrigued. You know, this res this is a critical response to keep us healthy, um, and, but then perturbations or anything that inhibits it from getting turned off has obviously these really um, profound effects on uh, people and leads to diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis. So can you please explain uh, what the grant was that you applied for and uh, what you're working on currently? I'm an immunologist by training and mostly studying the early immune responses. So since my PhD, I've been working on uh, the inducible inflammatory response or the first part of your immune system that gets activated, whether you have a cold or a bacterial infection and you know we know that this part of the pathway the inducible inflammation is critical to keep us healthy and protect us from infection but we also know that perturbations or this response lasting too long can lead to chronic inflammation and so my research has always focused on around the idea of trying to identify novel regulators of these pathways and trying to identify new ways that we can control these pathways when they go wrong and the area of research I got interested in during my postdoc was kind of the post-genomics uh, situation in which, you know, it's 15 years since we sequenced the human genome. For me, one of the most exciting things from that was the fact that I believe we we were all raised as protein-centric researchers. So we always studied different proteins and obviously they're really, really important. And some of the best, you know, drugs that we use are targeting various proteins. But what we discovered from sequencing the human genome is that only a really small fraction of the genome codes for protein, so 3% or less of the genome codes for protein. And what was really fascinating is the fact that the majority of our genome is producing RNA. And that's kind of been the biggest challenge since the sequencing of the human genome. We're all trying to figure out what does all this RNA do and is it biologically relevant and particularly in relation to disease. And they the family that I focus on are called the long non-coding RNA, which is, you know, an interesting name. <laughs> it says what they're not, so they don't code for protein. And they're basically this gene family that are um, anything that's more than 200 base pairs long. So it's a huge family. We now identified 16,000 in the human genome. And everyone is very interested in figuring out what they do. And my research is trying to figure out what they do in regulation. And so my project with ARNRF is um, focused on one in particular, one link RNA that we call link RNA COX-2. And it's a highly inflammatory inducible long known coding RNA. And why we're pretty excited about it in terms of arthritis is that it can also bind to a known autoantigen in arthritis patients. And so we're really trying to learn how it's involved in the regulation of these pathways and whether it is involved in the pathogenesis of rheumatoid arthritis. 
So I have a couple questions just kind of mm -hmm. hearing that. So one thing, you know, with the, the COX-2, it, it brings to mind COX-2 inhibitors. I guess what is the relationship of those medications then to what you're studying? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with the link RNA field, um, how link RNAs have been labeled when they're identified is um, somewhat of a um, potential misleading characterization in that they're named after their neighboring protein coding gene on the genome. So if you think of COX-2, um, the COX-2 inhibitors, so COX-2 is obviously one of the most highly inflammatory proteins and it lies on chromosome one. And the link RNA is about 50,000 base pairs away from COX-2. And that's why it was called link RNA COX-2. Um, and so at the moment, we're really trying to understand more about whether link RNA COX-2 has any role in regulating the neighboring protein coding gene. Uh, from our early siRNA work, we'd say that it, it's not affecting it. Um, but that's something we're looking at more now. Very interesting. So also, too, uh, you mentioned the regulation. You know, I, I think so, so often... Um, we think of diseases as just being a genetic problem. Um, but that's why I really love, you know, what you're working on because we're really talking about all the other factors that play into that. So, um, it, and what I heard you say is that, you know, when we get diseases and so forth, that the regulation of kind of turning off that inflammatory response. And I think back to when I first got sick, you know, I had a lot of strep and actually rheumatic fever. Um, so essentially what you're saying is that, at times the body can't turn it off, um, that, that yes. inflammation response. Okay. It's, it's kind of fascinating for a lot of chronic inflammatory disorders. <clears throat> In addition to autoimmunity, there's so much that we know and so much that we don't know. Because even with RA, we know that it's, there is a genetic component, but that, that's not everything, right? From monozygotic twin studies, you, you know, not necessarily just having the genetics will result in you having arthritis. So there's a lot more going on, which is why we're kind of fascinated with the epigenetics or, uh, you know, not what's imprinted just in your DNA, but the regulation that happens on your DNA and what does that mean in terms of the responses that you see. And um, also things like, you know, like you said, at your early stage of disease, you know, you had other infections and, you know, that's kind of a hallmark with a lot of um, also inflammatory diseases that what was the trigger that, you know, really initiated that first big event. And, you know, we know from retrospective studies that a lot of people have things like also antibodies in your system for 10 years before you have clinical symptoms symptoms but you know it's like this background boiling of things not going right in your body and then is there one trigger that just sends the entire inflammatory process out of control and so trying to understand those types of regulation I think will be critical for not only treating at an early stage but also potentially in diagnosing because one of the things we're really excited about in the link RNA field are that link RNAs appear to be even more cell type specific than protein coding genes. And so the idea of potentially using them as biomarkers is pretty exciting because they're really stable in body fluids. We can PCR them out of your serum or out of urine. And so the idea of them being really highly specific, we would love the idea of trying to study more in arthritis in patient serum. Can you identify signature? that are associated with different stages of disease. So yeah, there's a lot that goes on in the body and trying to figure out at which stages things go wrong and how we can intervene is an exciting area, I think. Yeah, you know, um, amongst the patient community, we talk about triggers a lot. It's something mm -hmm. that I think we sort of inherently understand in ourselves that it is a very important moment in our diseases. Um, but I feel like it's not sort of given enough credit, you know, when, when we do sort of, you know, we're, we're talking to our doctors and other healthcare professionals. Um, so I, I love that you're looking into this more because for me, I, I have this, this vision that in the future that um, we'll be able to screen for arthritis, you know, when some of these sort of triggering events happen. So say, um, like in my case, if you had a strep test, you would also get a, you know, potential, um, you know, what is your predisposition to arthritis test at the same time, you know, and do we need to be looking at things um, ahead of time? Is there something that we could do? Um, so from your research, do you think that is something that is possible down the line to look for, you know, the inflammatory disease predisposition? You know, with having the ANRF grant, 
you know, this is really helping me build on my area of research and that grant is fully focusing on Lincoln and Cox too. But beyond that, and because I've started in this field, I have the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of rheumatologists and so we've started a lot of pilot studies to see if you know some of my ideas are you know not crazy but potentially going down the right route and so this is because I'm really focused on inflammation and early inflammation you know I think a lot of the triggers what they have in common is inflammation right so whether it's you have an infection or some people will say you know things kind of got out of hand when I was extremely stressed or you know different life events that you can kind of correlate with initiation of disease. And so for me, inflammation kind of lies at the heart of all of those um, different situations. And so what we're really trying to do is, can we use these genes as potentially markers that would allow you to say on what could be really essentially a very easy clinical test that's just PCR, or based on a turnaround time of a couple of hours, could you design a profiling situation that, as you say, you know, when you go in for your first initial tests, if you think you have any predisposition to disease or family history, that you could very easily test along the same time as, you know, you're getting antibiotics for a bacterial infection. Could you actually just profile your serum quickly and say, actually, this looks more like this? Because a lot of the problems, as I'm sure you know, is getting diagnosed. And essentially, a a lot of the problems are that it's been so long and so much damage has already happened that ideally diagnosing earlier in all of these situations, I think, is a huge thing that we should be striving towards. It's just exciting to hear that your ideas sort of align with a lot of ideas that I think pop up on social media in the patient community as well. And it's sort of validating, you know, that sort of inherent knowledge that we have about, you know, our own bodies and our diseases as well. So it's, it's really exciting to hear. So your research looks specifically into RNA and long coding RNA. Can you please explain to us its relationship to DNA and the overall human genome and how it plays a role in inflammatory diseases? Yeah, so as I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, when we sequence the human genome, you know, we're sequencing all the DNA. And when you learn biology in school, you always learn the central dogma of how we see how information flows through the cell. And so we say DNA makes RNA to make protein. But that's our protein centric view, right? Where we always kind of put RNA as the middle, the middleman in between. In DNA and protein. While, you know, we know that RNA does a lot more than that. So we, you need all your RNAs to make protein. And now what we've learned from the human genome is that the majority of our cells make RNA that doesn't make protein. And it's not a critical component of the regulation to make protein. And so the question becomes, what does all of this RNA do? And the largest family of that are link, link RNA or long non coding RNA. And in relation to arthritis, we were able to take cells um, from arthritic patients and carry out RNA sequencing and identify what genes are up or down in comparison to healthy controls. And doing that, we've identified over 100 link RNAs that are highly turned on in the inflammatory situation. And now we're just trying to figure out how they're actually involved in regulating these pathways. So essentially, when you're talking about this protein-centric view, the, the model that comes to mind for me is the idea that the Earth was the center of the universe, you know, so many hundred of years ago. So that's essentially how we view DNA. But now you're saying that potentially it's, you know, the sun, it's something else, you know, may, may be sort of the center of, you know, this inflammatory response. Well, what's interesting uh, to that viewpoint is that also some people would argue that the world started with RNA and not DNA because RNA is unique in that it has the properties of both DNA and protein it can self-replicate. So there are some arguments that the world may have started with RNA and because it's kind of can be unstable that we evolved to have DNA and separate out compartments to make regulation, you know, much more tightly controlled than just RNA. So uh, yeah, so RNA has been critical forever. It's really exciting. <laughs> it's really yeah. interesting work. How does long non-coding RNA affect inflammation in the body? So again, we're at a pretty early stage in trying to figure out how this works. But what we do know so far is that if you have an inflammatory event or, you know, an infection, say, or even profiling um, RA patients, we see that a lot of these genes are, you know, 
turned on to really high levels, but there are also genes that are turned off. And the biggest challenge at the moment is then trying to actually understand functionally what they can do. And so for link RNA COX2, one of the pieces of information we have is that if you remove link RNA COX2 from cells, uh, you have this very dramatic phenotype where a number of genes are suddenly turned on that normally shouldn't be, such as interferon stimulated genes or signatures highly associated with diseases such as lupus. Um, whereas then on the other side, you also have a number of genes that are no longer are turned on, and many of these are inflammatory genes. So we would say that link RNA COX2 has both an um, inhibitory role as well as an activating role in controlling these pathways. So it seems to be, you know, very much an important regulator for turning things on and keeping things off. I think it's important to remember that the kind of research that you're doing is really foundational that we're talking about. Exactly. So even if a goal is treatment in the future, we're talking generations down we're the line. Talking yeah. quite a long way away. Well, I'll just say thank you on behalf of myself and a lot of other patients too for all the hard work you're doing. Thank you for joining us for Arthritis Now. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel here and join the conversation on Instagram and Twitter by using the hashtag CureArthritis. We'll see you next month for another episode of Arthritis Now. 